I was going to talk about the Sphinx and the pyramids, but uh, I got paid by the Saudi Arabian Airlines uh, to advertise their uh, their uh, company. <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, what you're seeing here, well, I'm not very good at advertising, but what you see here is a Saudi Arabian airline. Uh, well, okay, to be a bit more serious. I use this as an example. I mean, there's a few of you in the audience who know what I'm doing, so please keep quiet. The smet. Uh, it's a true story. I worked in Saudi Arabia for five years in the city of Riyadh. And in 1981, there was a strange commotion in the city. Uh, I was in my office, and uh, my Sudanese secretary came rushing in and said, there's rumors that they've closed the airport, and nobody's allowed to sell tickets at the agencies. And I thought, my God, there's a, some problem, maybe a coup d'etat or something. And actually, eventually we found out, people were phoning each other, very confused. But we found out that at the time it was King Khaled. Uh, and he was about to board the, the Royal Saudi Arabian airline. And as he approached the plane, his, uh, they, use, they call them mutawas, the religious police or religious priest, and he has this person, one that carries the Quran, and they follow him, you know, bearded guy. And <clears throat> the mutawa said, you can't go on this flight because there is the Christian cross on the airplane. Now, you may or may not know this, but any e expression of other religions in Saudi Arabia is forbidden. You can't actually wear a cross. In fact, they went as far. <clears throat> I remember at the time when Swiss Air used to fly there, they actually made Swiss Air change their flag to land in Saudi Arabia. So everybody said, well, where is this cross? And there's all confusion. And this Mutawa kept saying, well, it's on the airplane. And nobody could see it. And I wonder if you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, some of you can, but, you know, Pauline, please. <laughs> It, it, the idea is to show you that nobody had seen it. it. It is there, actually. And it's one of those strange things that the minute somebody points something out, then everybody sees it. Okay. This is how it was before. And, uh, whoops. Apparently, I have to do this manually. James, what do I do? Uh, I think I'll go with the next. I've, I've gone a bit closer, and <coughs> I don't know if you spotted it, but it's between the S and the A, right? Okay, now that you see it, you see it, that's it. And it was on every airplane, it was on every ticket, on every uh, Saudi uh, travel shop, on, the, on plastic glasses, on everything. And it had to go. Suddenly, Saudi Arabia was flooded with crosses. And they couldn't have it. And it's true that he closed the airport, he gave the order to close the airport, and they actually changed it. And what they did, they very simply, oops, they very simply, let me get the pictures, there. They removed one of the arms, and that is how it looks today. So there you are. Uh, I happen to have seen something that everybody should have seen before, but for some strange reason, they didn't. And the minute I saw it, everybody saw it. <coughs> and let me show you what it is. And that, maybe you know. Okay, you can see it better, by the way, here. Huh? There it is. So there you are, that's what I saw. It was in 1983, I was in the Cairo Museum. I've told this story so many times, so I'm going to go very fast here. Because I want to move to the Sphinx. Tonight is the Sphinx. Uh, <coughs> Well, there you are. What I saw is a picture with, uh, of the Giza necropolis, of the three main pyramids. Uh, and I asked myself, why is this uh, third pyramid, the smaller one, offset to the left or to the east? And it bugged me. It's one of those things. And it stayed in my mind. Uh, eventually, I'll cut this very short because I want to move very quickly here. We only have an hour. An hour for me is intellectual foreplay, by the way. 
I need two hours at least. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there you are. I, you know the story, you know, there's shafts in the pyramids and uh, they point to, and uh, the, the king wanted to go, we know this from the pyramid text, to these particular stars, and I proposed what is known as the Orion correlation theory in 90, in, well, I published it first in, in the magazine, in academic journals in 89, and it finally got into a book form in 94, and the BBC did a big deal about it, and I was very happy until the next morning with every Egyptologist got upset. Everybody with an ist at the end, you know, Egyptologists, archaeologists, philologists, they all got very upset with this one. But there you are, everybody finally saw it. It's one of those things. It's, it's. So the big question is, were we dealing with a coincidence or was it deliberate? And it went on and on and the BBC did a counter program and they accused me of this and I was called a Zionist and I was called a charlatan and I, was, I went through the whole thing. By the way, I would like to say we have a very honored guest here, I don't know if you're aware, Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, the astrobiologist, is sitting down there. Can you please wave, Chandra? Uh, Professor Chandra and I are writing a book called The Cosmic Womb, which will be published next year. There did a bit of advertisement, Chandra. So there you are, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Professor Chandra knows, we, it's one of those things, when you bring out a, a new idea of this kind, uh, be it in physics or biology, or, you're going to go through the, the grill, and it goes on for a long time. So for about 25 years I was insulted, and you know, the, I don't know if you know, but the man with the hat, and the professor Zahi Hawass, who accused me of all sorts of things. The one I liked most is that I was supposed to be, according to him, a Zionist. I don't know how he figured this out. A Zionist Jew. I happen to be Christian. And the trouble is that in this country, for some reason, there was a book published called The Stylist Conspiracy that accused me of being an anti-Semitic. So I said, make up your mind, I can't be both, you know. I can't be both. <laughs> Either this or that. Uh, you can't be both. Uh, maybe with quantum mechanics we can be both, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, there you are. Uh, I'm going to blow a bit of trumpet here. Uh, after all these things that went on and accusations and articles, uh, finally two uh, uh, physicists, mathematicians at the University of Salento in Italy decided to do the right thing and they passed through, they passed the Orion correlation theory through what is known as a falsification test. The idea is to, to try and falsify it. And they, they tried everything, they did quantitative, statistical, I'm just showing you the front page, it's about a 30 page document, and to their surprise they couldn't falsify it, so it's good, that's it. I don't want to argue with Egyptologists, there you are. So that's the story of the Orion correlation theory, we move to the Sphinx, I think, I know. There we are. We go to Egypt. And, uh, whoops, I don't know why I have this. Ah, that's, thank you, David. <laughs> David, this, the mystery of the Sphinx. Now, the Sphinx, let me move here fast. I wrote a book with uh, Graham Hancock, you all know Graham Hancock, yes? And uh, in 96, and we made it even bigger fuss because we said that it wasn't just a correlation uh, with the pyramids and the, the stars, but we proposed that the best fit was in a date of 10,500 BC, and that was really a big problem for academics. The date just did not ring for them. It was too distant, there was nobody there, no, there was no, no, no civilization to carve the Sphinx. The idea is that the whole Giza necropolis, you see it in, in one of the pictures, correlates. If you use astronomy, you can make it correlate to that date, an image of the date involving the constellation of Orion and the constellation of Leo. <clears throat> I don't know if you've read the books or seen this on TV, I don't want to go through all this again. What I'm going to talk about is how this has progressed with, uh, with Professor Robert Schock. You might have heard of Robert Schock, the man who proposed the age of the Sphinx, big controversy. We've written a book together called The Sphinx, 
not very original, but the Sphinx, which will be published, <laughs> which will be published uh, in a couple of months' time. So, James. Ah. Now, one of the things that uh, was discussed a lot in this book I wrote with Graham Hancock, by the way, it was Keeper of Genesis, uh, was that the Egyptians were talking all the time in their texts, in their religious texts, of a period that they considered to be the beginning of their event, the beginning of their civilization. They called it the first time. In ancient Egyptian, it was, uh, uh, they used two, two words, zeptepi. This means first time. And in this first time, they claimed that the gods had come down and established their civilization. And that the pharaoh belonged to this first time. In other words, that each pharaoh that ruled on, uh, in Egypt was considered to have come from this first time. They just passed the rule from one pharaoh to the other. 400 pharaohs throughout the whole dynastic period. Now, the logic of this argument was that if Orion, uh, the, the, belt, the belt of Orion, was considered to be the god Osiris, as they say in the text, and if Osiris is supposed to be the god of the first time, as they told us, then could the stars have a first time? And uh, uh, Crichton mentioned this uh, business of precession. If you precess the stars of Orion's belt to the beginning of the present precession cycle, you get to this date of 10,500 BC, and everything locks. The pyramid locks with the three stars of Orion's belt, the Sphinx locks with the, the constellation of Leo, Again, I don't want to go too much this because you've, I'm sure you've seen it on television and all these books that were uh, written about it. However, what we didn't do at the time, and uh, I think David, you'll talk a bit about this later on. Yeah? Okay, here is the here is the monument, the Sphinx of Giza. Have you been there, by the way? All of you? Who hasn't been there? All of you. <laughs> okay, I'm a bunch of liars you have here. <laughs> uh, okay, well, for those who haven't been there, uh, I, I, I think I'm safe to say there is nothing like this monument. It is a very impressive monument. Uh, just a few statistics, it's 72 meters long, or if you like, the, 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 the distance of a... Of a uh, I'm trying to find a comparable distance of a, of a, of a uh, well, of this university, I guess, half the university, this college. It's about 15 meters high, which is about three stories, sorry, 15 stories of a building. And uh, it's just big. But when you go in, uh, as this picture is taken, if you go literally below it, it has this amazing effect. And particularly, if you happen, if you're lucky to be taken there at night, it's, it's a very eerie monument. It's as if it's ignoring you, like the picture. It's as if it doesn't care that you're there. It's, it's timeless. It's just, it just, it, and it's obviously looking at something. It's staring at the horizon. In fact, its name is Horus of the Horizon. There to give you a sense of uh, size. You can see the, the person right there between the poles. Here is the, the, there is a stella, by the way, in the, in the pose of this, in the, in, right on the breast of the Sphinx. It's known as the Dream Stella. Egyptologists consider it to be a, um, a kind of superstitious uh, uh, declaration by Pharaoh. But it actually says that this is the place of the first time. And the question is, is it? Is it the place that, for the Egyptians, represented the beginning of time, the beginning of their civilization? the beginning of creation for them. There's the Sphinx at night, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go fast here. Actually, my pictures are all mixed up. But uh, If you were to look at sunrise today at the spring equinox, and you could see the stars that are behind the sun, as uh, Crichton was speaking, what you would see would be the constellation of Aquarius rising before the sun. Hence this uh, 
although Crichton said that uh, we are in the age of Pisces, uh, there's many arguments about this. We're definitely on the verge between the movement from Pisces to Aquarius. Anybody over 60 years old here, apart from David and my brother <laughs> and Professor Chandra? <laughs> Actually, curiously, who's above 60? Ah, not many. Okay, well, you probably remember there was this big thing in the 60s. We all, everybody was going in the streets and saying the age of Aquarius. And, and nobody knew what they were talking about, really. All they knew is that something was happening, or supposedly happening, that was going to change the age. Well, that's what it's about. We're moving into the age of Aquarius. But, uh, well, this is annoying. Okay, so that's what you would see if you could see behind the sun. So I've removed the light of the sun, and here's the constellation of Aquarius. It's, well, this was done last year, but it's the same for now. Now, if you move backwards, you go to the period of Jesus. This thing is... Come and do me up, David, darling. Stop fidgeting, okay? Uh, stop touching me, will you? There you go. Uh. We're old friends. If you go to the time of Jesus, you fall into the, the period of Pisces. In fact, the Piscean age was very marked by the, the, the period of Jesus. Uh, in, uh, in Egypt in particular, and in most Orthodox countries, they still use the symbol of the fish to represent the era of Jesus. And if you move uh, backwards to the time of supposedly the Pyramid Age, uh, where the, the pyramids were supposedly built, you come to the age of Aries. And that's what you would see if you were there uh, in 2500 BC. And if you move backwards to 8000 BC, it would be the age of Cancer. And if you move to that date of 10,500 BC, what you see is the constellation of Leo. It's one of those bizarre, if it is a coincidence, it's the most bizarre coincidence. Because at this precise time, the precise moment, which is the spring equinox, and you, you, if you were there at the time, you would see this lion in the sky where the sphinx is looking directly at it. If you would turn south, you would see the three stars of Orion's belt precisely at the meridian and only in 10,500 BC, mimicking the pyramids on the ground. I'll show you a picture later. I'm not quite sure if I have it here. Right. And so we propose this so-called um, correlation theory of 10,500 BC. Okay, here it is, Sphinx in 10,500 BC. And uh, strange enough, if you superimpose the, uh, the constellation on the Sphinx, you get this strange correlation. Uh, I think the pictures are all mixed up. Uh, yeah, that's uh, can I, uh, James, I think all the numbering or whatever has gone, I'm not following this. Can you put the, the whole pictures on the screen? Yes. Sorry about this. I wanted to go here. This one? Yeah, how come I'm moving? Double turn. Yeah. And then. It's kind of jumped all these pictures for some reason. Okay, fine. Let's let's start it. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about this, and it seems to be a mix up with the Okay, we're at the temple of Horus in Edfu. Let's me move fast here because I have to leave room for uh, for my brother and David. Uh, the Temple of Horus. Anybody's been to the Temple of Horus by Oh wow. Who are the liars here? Who hasn't been to the Temple of Horus? Ah, okay. Okay, the Temple of Horus, it's uh, the only way to describe it really, although it's built in Ptolemaic times, is a book in stone. It is literally loaded with texts, full of texts. You go inside and you feel like you're inside the book. Now, these texts, let's hope we get the pictures right, uh, uh, speak of many things, but I'm going to focus on two things they speak. <coughs> it seems that the whole idea of ancient Egyptian uh, uh, texts are centered around one book, 
sort of like the Bible or the Old Testament of the Egyptians. And they translate something like the specification of the sacred mounds of the early primeval age. And apparently these sacred mounds, after a huge study that was done on this text, by the way, by Egyptologists, uh, <clears throat> speak about the area of Memphis as if there is these sacred mounds were there. Memphis is where modern Cairo is, where the pyramids are. Uh, and for the, for the Egyptians, this Memphite area was considered sacred, this mounds. And the, the idea was that on something this, to do with the sacred mounds, they, they inspired the building of temples. So there were mounds before, for some reason they were considered sacred, and they inspired the building of temples. That's how it all began. Uh, here are some of the depictions. The other thing that the Edfu texts speak is the myth of Horus. The temple of Horus, and it's all about the myth of Horus. And here we come to something very interesting. In this so-called myth of Horus, which I think David will speak a bit more about, they give us dates. They tell us when this first time, uh, or rather, on what particular day of the year this first time began. A sort of biblical genesis. And they give us a very unusual date. In the Egyptian calendar, they call it the first of Tibi. It is the first day of the fifth month of the calendar. And this is a very, very new thing, because here we suddenly have a date. Something happens on this date. And they tell us that what happened on this date is some gigantic battle that took place between the sun god. He appears strangely as the sun disk, like some sort of flying saucer. And he annihilates literally, the whole army uh, with this magical disk or this magical craft the whole army of the uh, enemies of the kingdom. The enemies run by the god Seth, the evil Setian god. And this battle took place on the first of Tibi, on that fifth, first day of the fifth month, and this uh, Horus individual is crowned as first king of Egypt. He becomes the first Horus king of Egypt. All pharaohs that followed were considered the reincarnation of this individual. And strangely enough, the Sphinx bears the same name. The Sphinx is known as Horus of the Horizon, Horem Achetz. And clearly there's something to do here with this date. So we decided to look at it. The, the story goes that he defeated this, uh, this god Seth. Uh, there is much that follows that uh, Seth escaped and he changed himself into a hypotenuse. I'm not going to go into that. Now, <clears throat> it's one of these strange things when you do research, and I fell on the study of this. Uh, and David and me have been looking at this very closely. It's an essay written in a, in a journal by an Egyptologist. This thing doesn't move. And it gives this chronology of the Horus myth, and this is where we get this date. Ah, there you are. Accordingly, it was on the first of Tibi that the forces of Chaos met their doom near the place called Tod. Tod is the ancient name for Edfu. So something happened there that changed everything, that created the Egyptian civilization, and it was considered this, this moment where the first king was king. And they call it the first occasion. It's translated first occasion, which is the steps zepidate, which in astronomy we derived at the Giza Necropolis to be 10,500 BC. So let's see how this date might connect to the Sphinx. This is entirely new stuff, by the way. It's a, I'm presenting this for the first time. And there you are. The, the, well, I'll skip this. There's a very strange thing that happens, by the way, and my brother will talk about this. The first of Tibi the first day of the fifth month of their year. Now we know they began their year on the summer solstice. So if you count, their months were of 30 days, which by the way, Crichton, this is interesting because they used the 360 days of the year, as you know, which implies that they knew the circle, the degrees. And if you count 
three months of 30 days, and you add one day, you arrive, sorry, you count four months of 30 days, and you add one day, you arrive at the first day of the first month, it's 121. 121. I'm just mentioning this because uh, my brother will talk a bit more about this. 121 is a prime number. Sorry, it is divided by two prime numbers, by one prime number squared. So if you multiply 11 by 11, you get 121. And later you will see this is very, very odd because two things, this number has cropped up in the Great Pyramid. By the way, I don't know if any of you, but any of you get this 11 number cropping in your lives? My daughter says. It's amazing that this prime number, 11, keeps cropping in people's lives. It's very, very strange. Anyway, you will see later that the pyramid is designed on the basis of a grid that uses the number 11. And we, by the way, another mystery, but we don't have time to do this. You remember this door that was discovered in, in 1993, the famous door be, behind the shaft of the Queen's Chamber? Who remembers this door? That was, uh, not all of you, strange, a big event. Well, everybody wants to know what's behind this door. We still don't know. We found a space behind the door. And this space has three hieroglyphics that give the number 121. Seems to be a magical code of the, of the design of the pyramid. But there it is. So on the 21st day of the year is this first of Tibi. So uh, I want to leave this to you. Here we are at the Temple of Edfu. I'm just going to show you some pictures. We move a bit fast here. Somebody did a wonderful reconstruction. I don't know if you see it on the internet. There it is. The some more text. I'm going to skip here. We're going to get to the Sphinx. The first occasion. Now we go to these mounds. And what we discovered, or rather a group of researchers and myself have discovered, is that there are indeed mounds in the area of Cairo. They're still there. They're, they've been there for millions of years. And this is where most of the pyramids are built on. The Great Pyramid, a lot of people are not aware of this, is actually built on a mound. It cuts a small mound. It seems that the mounds, like they say in the text, were the origins of the placement of these monuments. They chose the place. And, and strangely enough, <clears throat> when you look at the whole landscape, you find that there is some sort of geometrical plan. It's as if, as if they picked the, the mounds which had meaning. For example, well, again, I don't want to go into this, but the Giza necropolis is at 45 degrees to another mound, which is the Mount of Heliopolis. Another mound, which is the Topolis, uh, is at, uh, exactly at the, at the latitude, or due, due east or west. Another mound is at the rising of the solstice. There is clearly something to do with geometry and astronomy that they combine to create this sort of sacred landscape. In other words, the whole region, and it's a very vast region, it's about 40 kilometers long and something like 15 kilometers wide, becomes like a giant sacred temple. The fantastic thing about this, I lived in Cairo for many, many years, is that these mounds exist, and if you can imagine the, the, the modern city disappear, and you're left with these pyramids that are still there, the sacred landscape is still there. It's as if it's ghosted in the modern city. What a wonderful thing that they could do if they knew how to exploit this thing properly for tourism, by the way. But they don't. They have revolutions instead. The three pyramids of Giza in the area. Something is not working well. Okay, you're looking at the site. Uh, and I've removed the pyramids so you could see the knolls, the mounds. Now, there was another small, not mound, a kind of knoll that stuck out. I've pointed it here. It's been, it was there since eons, God knows how millions of years. This eventually became the head of the Sphinx. And we're beginning to suspect that it probably had some features that perhaps uh, inspired the idea of a lion's head. Uh, it's been suggested that it might have looked something like this. In any case, this eventually became the head of the Sphinx, and they carved uh, under the rock to create the Sphinx. The Sphinx is actually carved in the rock. Uh, there is uh, what we call... Uh, 
strange simulacra. I don't know if you've seen this in rocks, in clouds, by the way. People see images in clouds. There's many of these faces. They're natural features, but you can see why. I don't know if you see the features here. Does it resemble a bit of sort of profile of a, of a lion or a, or a leonine face? We know that there were very, very, lions were, by the way, infested the area. It must have been very strange to live uh, even in the Pyramid Age around the Cairo area. The, the lions used to come down and, and drink the water of the Nile and then go in the desert. There we are. By the way, I don't know if you've seen this, David. Sorry, this was, this was found under near the Great Pyramid, and it's fourth, it's fourth dynasty. Okay, you see something went funny here. I've got the images. I was going to show you how the mounds work. You see it? There, and here is the geometry. James, I don't know. I've got to the last image here. This is correct, but for some reason it's... Okay, let me just... It should... Okay, I'm going to pick it here. I'm gonna pick it there, yeah? Yeah. It, 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 and then, we'll have to watch for Jean-Paul because all this is... you got about 15 minutes for Jean-Paul. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Okay, apparently I've got 15 minutes. Let's move very quickly to this state. You're looking... Not the wrong picture. <laughs> uh, James, it's okay. Okay, well, I've got the picture I want, but it's not in order. <laughs> the Sphinx is not in isolation. There are two temples, for those who have seen it, there are two temples, one to the left of the Sphinx, known as the Sphinx Temple, and one uh, <clears throat> on uh, virtually, on almost on its right, but almost in front of it, known as the Valley Temple. And there's a causeway. There's a causeway which is still visible, but most of it is destroyed, that runs at an angle to the Sphinx. It's always been a mystery. And in, when I wrote the book with Graham Hancock, we noticed that it was aligned to what we call the cross quarter. It didn't hit us at the time that it's aligned on the 121st day after the summer solstice. In other words, it's aligned to this first of Tibi. And here we have it. We have a connection between the original creation myth, which tells us this date in the Temple of Edfu, and somehow we find it connected to something 2,500 years before in the Sphinx architectural plan. There is no doubt at all, in my mind, that the Sphinx is a representation or an image or a, or a symbol of this very first king. I'm beginning to call it the Westminster of, of Egypt. It's where kings were crowned. It's where kings were buried. It's where great events of coronation took place. It isn't a burial place. It is a place where many, many things happened and probably they celebrated the original coronation of the first pharaoh and used it for many, many events. Now, I maintain that it is related to the date of 10,500 BC because of the astronomy that we get. It doesn't mean that it was built at that time. There's a lot of arguments about this, and I think David will kind of argue a bit against it, being an Egyptologist. Uh, this is a sort of strange relationship we have. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm usually not liked by Egyptology, except David. Like you like me too? No. Uh, well, I don't like you either. <laughs> there you are. However, however, this gives us the date of in the year, the fifth, the first day of the fifth month. It doesn't tell us which epoch. So we know which date of the year, but it doesn't tell us the epoch. You cannot tell the epoch by knowing where the sun is. The sun is always at the same place or moves throughout the year and has been doing this since the creation of this planet and will do so that this planet is destroyed. The sun always is in the north extreme at the solstice and moves along the year for six months and returns. So you cannot know the epoch, but you can know the epoch if you relate it, if you bring into this equation, if you like, stars. 
So what is, seems to be coming out is many things indicates that the Sphinx is certainly older than the pyramids. The geology tells us so from Robert Chalk, the astronomy tells us so, but you need stars to lock everything in that date. You need to link stars. And therefore, the theory now is that we had an original solar complex, the Sphinx with its temples, fixed on this particular date. And then here is the solar temple, you can see it uh, from very high up. Here are the, the temples, the causeway, the mortuary temple and the Sphinx temple with this alignment. And then, whoops, okay, here's some images of the temples. By the way, a great mystery, I don't want to go into that. People always talk about how the pyramids were built. It's the big intriguing thing. But the pyramids are not the most difficult thing to build on this complex. It is these temples. And you can see from the size of the stones, uh, judging from the people around, some of these stones weigh 200 tons. On average, they're about 50 to 100 tons. Now, I don't know if you realize what this means. A 100 ton weight is taking 200 family cars and squishing them together. That's 100 tons. Now, apart from the fact of how they move these stones, which I don't care what Egyptologists tell us, there is, we cannot figure out as engineers and architects how 200 tons or, or even 100 ton blocks were moved, let alone lifted in these positions. But that isn't the mystery. The mystery is why? Because you don't need 200 tons to build a temple. And we know that they knew this. Because there are temples before this, we have temples at Saqqara, and we have temples after this. So, let me give you a kind of uh, equivalent of this. It's raining outside, it's pouring rain like you have in the country. My brother and I live in Costa del Sol, so we don't suffer from this. But, instead of taking your umbrella, you take your whole cupboard on your shoulders. It doesn't make sense. This is the equivalent of that. They're building with blocks that you don't need. In fact, you, you, it, it causes a problem to build these blocks, uh, temples with these blocks. So the question is why, and nobody has come up with the answer. We simply do not know. One of the great mysteries of this, this site, surprisingly ignored, very often ignored by Egyptologists. Now, the odd thing is that all, not only they went to the whole trouble of building these temples with these massive blocks. People say to impress us. Maybe that's what they want to do. So we can say, wow, they, they use the hundred tons. Well, if that was the case, it doesn't work because they actually covered them. They cladded them with granite blocks. They actually hid them. I don't want to use the word because I know I get accused very quickly, but this is alien technology. And I don't mean ET. It is a technology that doesn't fit our logical way of thinking. It doesn't fit logical engineering. We don't think like that today. We won't do this. And the question is, who are these people who think this way? And again, as I introduce my brother in about five minutes, you're going to see there's some very, very odd things that can come out from the design of these temples and these pyramids. Okay, so they added pyramids. And when you combine pyramids that represent stars, in this case the belt of Orion, then you get that date. It is a solar stellar temple complex. There is no doubt in my mind that this is what we have here. Now the big question is, how old? I know that I've been accused many, many times of saying the pyramids were built in 10,500 BC. I've never said this. I'm convinced that the pyramids were built in the epoch that the Egyptologists say so. What proves it is the shafts. The shafts in the pyramids that point to stars, these stars, Orion's belt, in 2500 BC. But they represent an earlier date. They commemorate an earlier date. They commemorate an event that was so important to them that they had to do this. They did this enormous complex. The big question is what? What really happened? What was this battle? Who was the sun god that came? And to ignore this, to, to simply call it a, 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 a funeral area is, well, it's a disservice to our civilization. We need to get to the bottom of this. Now, let me move. 
here I mentioned the full correlation. I'm going to go to this picture. There you are, you can see it in color. It was done by Graham Hancock. So when you put the sky in 10,500 BC, you get Orion correlating with the pyramids on the ground, very precisely. You get the Nile correlating with the Milky Way, and you get Leo correlating with the Sphinx. It, you can't have this as a coincidence. There's too many factors. I was in Milano, that's to introduce my bro brother's talk now. I was in Milan, uh, when was it, in December, and I gave a talk near the Cathedral of Milan. And I wanted to tell, I speak Italian by the way, I wanted to tell my audience how the concept of what we call coincidence works with different people. Now the, the, the piazza where there is a cathedral is full of pigeons, like Trafalgar Square, it's loaded with pigeons. And as I was talking and sitting in front of a table, standing in front of a table, I said, what if a pigeon would come and land on the table? What would you say? And uh, they were a bit confused, and they said, yeah, well, what would you say if a pigeon came? And they said, well, there's a lot of pigeons out there, and we've never seen it happen before, but it's probably one pigeon that came in, and it's one of those strange things. It's a coincidence. I said, fine, but what if another pigeon comes now? And then, slowly, about half the audience says, well, it's a bit strange, but still a lot of people said coincidence. And I said, what if a third? What if a fourth? What if a fifth? At what point do you stop saying coincidence? Now there are some of us who are happy with two pigeons. Some of us need three pigeons. I'm one of these five pigeons guys. You need to give me five pigeons. And Egyptologists need about 15 pigeons before they start thinking. All right? I've, I've, I've presented this pigeon analogy in America. It's becoming good. People meet and say, how many pigeons are you? And I say, I'm three. I say, sorry, no, no, no. I'm a two pigeon guy. I don't know. I can't talk to you. This is the thing that's coming up with the site. We're having coincidence upon coincidence upon coincidence. And when will Egyptologists stop saying coincidence? And you're going to hear now another bizarre coincidence. My brother Jean-Paul here is an architect. By the way, I want you to encourage him. It's his first talk in England. He usually talks in Spanish in Spain, but he's going to give his first talk in English in England. So please make him welcome. And he's, a, he's now semi-retired, he's an architect, and he knows about design. And uh, he's been pestering me for years. He's my older brother, by the way. I grew under his shadow. I really did. I know you don't believe this, but he used to look like James Dean when he was young. Was big trouble growing with an older brother looks like James Dean. Oh my girl, never mind, that's another story. <laughs> There you go, yeah. <laughs> anyway, where am I? <laughs> He's been pestering me for years. For years. Come and look at this mathematics. Come and I say, listen, don't get me in trouble with Egyptologists. I already am in big trouble. I've had enough fights. It's been 30 years with this correlation theory, with this date of 10,500 BC, and they've insulted me on television, and it, that's it. I don't want to know more about mysteries with the pyramids. Because what he was telling me was something that seemed impossible. He was finding things. Among many others, by the way, there's many mathematicians who have been pestering me for years. You'd be surprised how many theories I have about the pyramids per week. But these are architects, mathematicians. And finally I said, let me have a look. Let me have a look. And I had to say, you know, you, you're about pigeon four here. You're about pigeon four. So let me have a look. Because you can't argue with mathematics. One and one is two. Two and two is four. One line, you can measure it. That's what mathematics does. And he talks mathematics. He's one of these numerical characters who if you give him his date, he'll tell you which day, which day of the week you were born and all this business. He's got numbers in his head. And I believe all of us do have this. Hence why this 11. Uh, I, before I get you on stage, John Paul, would you please come and be with you? Give him a good hand. He needs some encouragement from you guys. He's going to take you to Pigeon 4, OK? Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to say that we're, uh, we've taken the leap of writing a book together, Dr. Chandra and myself. 
we talked about this for years because we really feel that these monuments need to be understood with what we know of science today and I'll be very brief here so I can leave the time but we know today what we didn't know 50 years ago we know that there is a hundred thousand hundred billion galaxies out there a hundred billion galaxies some of these galaxies are 13 billion light years away from us it is beyond our imagination beyond anything to conceive this space and these numbers and each of these hundred billion galaxies have an average of a hundred billion stars the conclusion today among cutting-edge scientists and you have one here is that it's the reverse of what we used to say 50 years ago it would seem strange and odd that there isn't life out there the probabilities are extremely high added to this is what we know about quantum mechanics I don't want to get it's my big thing these days quantum mechanics we have to examine and what we know about neuroscience how the brain works this monument that we will talk about was designed by a genius there is no question about it the question is where did the genius get the information from we can prove that it contains high advanced mathematics we can prove that it contains meteorological information about the size of the planet this is what this weird monument brings out the great pyramid but the question is where did it all come from and we've attempted this book to try and answer it it's called the cosmic womb by the way so remember it's next year okay jean paul boval okay. okay. we need to change the pictures james where is james james where are you Turn your mic off. Should very step to the photo. Okay, good evening everybody. As Robert, my brother, said, oh, this oh, is my... Oh, 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 sorry. Turn off. Turn we have to turn this off. Turn off. I'm turned off. I'm turned off. Turn off? Okay. Good evening. I'll start again. As my brother said, it's my first talk in English. It's not our mother tongue, but uh, I do a lot in Spanish, and I'm going to try in English now. Before we start, I want to tell you something. Robert is a great speaker. I'm not. I'm in mathematics and design, so we're very different. And another point, what uh, Maria and Jess said about the Maltese, we, Robert and I, had nothing to do with this business of not taking the information out of Malta. Okay? So from there, we'll start talking. Now, everybody, we're not going to go into the pyramid details. The picture you've got there is the Great Pyramid of Egypt. I suppose many people know every, all the statistics about it and everything. So we're going to jump directly in the design. I want you to understand that I'm an architect, or was, uh, still am. And uh, I look at this project like a project to start a design. So somewhere along the line, I have to design this. I have to put it on paper, if you want, so that it can be built by other people. Now, the information I get comes from many other sources, religious, astronomical, mathematical, geographical, whatever you want. But I, my job is to design it. And what I'm going to tell you today is has something to do about the design. It has nothing to do about the building. It has nothing to do about its pro what it's supposed to be or what it is going to be. Nobody really knows. What I can tell you is that certain factors have been involved in this building in the design factor, okay? So, we'll go there. Rob, can you go? Okay. Right. What you... Just keep this uh, okay, no. no we'll go to the... No, she is. <laughs> okay, the first two pictures that you saw that Robert jumped were the casing blocks. These are blocks. What you see of the pyramid today is the core. It's not the facing blocks. Put it back, Rob, please. Okay, these are the facing blocks on the north face that are left, and from these blocks we have determined that they, they go up to the peak of the pyramid, the apex, if you want, at a certain angle, and the angle has been calculated to about 51.84 degrees. How has it been calculated? Through these blocks, okay? Now, there's been a big controversy, uh, put the other picture, please. 
This is a very old picture, probably in, in around the 1939 taken. You can see the damage there is. So it's very difficult to assess exactly what this looked like when it was finished. Okay, where is the next one? We're going to go very fast there. Okay. This is the pyramid as our friends Egyptologists see it when it was finished, okay? It had these casing stones, but if you notice at the peak, it's not really a peak compared to other pyramids. It is, there is a slight truncated area there. Which one do I press? This is how it looked, how it's supposed to look. Now, if you look at this next picture, you'll find that the faces of the pyramid have what they call an incline, a concavity, okay? Which really what it produces, if you look at it carefully, it there you go, there's a picture that, that was taken, I think, in 1943, I'm not sure, by a British pilot, okay? And there you can see the, the Great Pyramid, you can see the face is divided, if you want, in, with a concavity. This is what we see. Now, this is an aerial picture of the pyramid itself, and you, you, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but you can see the concavity of the four sides. Now, up to now, we were always told, until recently, that uh, it had four sides, but it had, it, actually it has eight sides, okay? Next one, Rod, please. There. This is an artist's impression showing you the eight sides of the, of the pyramid, and this is our friend and great Egyptologist Flinders Petri, who has topographed, has detailed all the um, Giza Plateau, especially the Great Pyramid. He is, actually his measurements today are still valid. A lot of people refer to him as that. Go on. This is a plan of what Mr. Petri drew about the Great Pyramid. You notice there is a wording there that says concavity 36 to 37 inches. This is what he devised. Now, 36 to 37 inches is about what you see there in metric numbers, is I think, I can't see very well, 0, 914, 914. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm reading it here. I can read it there. 914 and 938, okay? Now, what happens is that this was done uh, about 130 years ago, and funny enough, these measurements are very, very important. Now, you can read there. Robert, you want to say yeah. that? Uh, I'm going to do a bit of the, the Egyptologist, so very fast. Huh? We want, imagine an architect, imagine that Jean-Paul is the architect of the Great Pyramid. And what happens to an architect? He gets called by a man or a woman who wants to build something. We call this the client, if you like, uh, the king or a priest or whoever was going to tell him what they want. Now, the only source of information we have are the pyramid texts. They're found in pyramids of the fifth dynasty. And the latest findings, the, 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they were translated uh, most recently by an American Egyptologist, James Allen. They're considered the most up-to-date translation. And he concluded something that Egyptologists were very confused and something that I've been arguing for years. Egyptologists believed that there was a, a, an earlier stellar cult and then it, it began to be a solar cult. Now we know, as I was saying since the last 20 years, that it wasn't the case. They're combined. There is an Osirian cult, which was related to the stars, the belt of Orion, and there was a sun cult. And everything to do with the pyramid, text, and therefore the pyramid, is the relationship between the dead king and the sun and the stars. And if I'm going to give a brief to you, I'm, I'm, I'm King Cheops, by the way, here in this story. I'm the pharaoh. Huh? I mean, it seems down to this. It's as if they wanted some sort of machine, all right, between brackets, of course, inverted commas, to make use of the sun in some way, like maybe the energy of the sun, and to convert the physical body of a king or, a, or a, into a non-material entity. That's what they wanted to do. We know this from the text. And they convert him into a soul star. That's the objective of the client. He wants that. And he wants somehow to dispatch this converted 
non-entity, a soul or star soul, to a, to a region in the sky, in the north and in the south. In the south, Orion's belt, in the north, the circumpolar stars. That's what he wants. The question is, have with this brief, what is he going to design? Why does it come out to be a pyramid? That's the instruction that he has. So you take it from there. I want you to design me a pyramid. To do I'll that. try and design a pyramid like Robert wants, okay? Go back to the next one. Okay. If you notice, there are three figures here. One is a circle, which represents the sun. The other is a hexagon, okay? Combined, it is two pyramids, one into the other. And the third one is a star. These three figures combined together is what the pharaoh wants. So these three figures will have to be incorporated in the design. Now, to start the design, he has to first decide on the angles he wants. Now, he chooses what we call in, 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 in Egyptians call a second, which is a relation of five and a half to seven. The only problem is that the, the Egyptians used to like whole numbers, so they changed the five and a half to 11 and the seven to a 14. They've doubled it if you want, which gives us a relation. Why did they choose this angle is quite simple. If you were to divide the hypotenuse by the base, you would get a number which is what we call the golden ratio, which is 1.618. This number you have to keep in mind because it will come on the next picture. And if also if you divide the height okay, of the triangle by the base, you get also an, a, what they call an indefinite number, which is 1.27272 eternally. It doesn't stop. That number has to be kept in mind because later it will come up. First is the 1.618, which is very important, and now go to the next one, please. Okay. What he wanted to do was to convert the solar disk into a construction, which was a pyramid. So he took his measurements of, uh, which we'll find out later why he took those measurements. He took the measurements of a royal cubit, and he, and he decided to make a pyramid, a square representing the circumference of a pyramid. That was his first approach. Now, the number 1760 is very important because each side of the pyramid is 440 royal cubits. And we'll see why the royal cubit comes later on. Can you go? Okay. If we go now to the hexagon, which is a standard figure, an universal figure, in other words, we divide we insert a perfect uh, hexagon into a perimeter, into a circumference, and we get, if we divide the circumference by 6, which is the hexagon number, which we get 0.52359. It is not a number, it is a proportion between the perimeter divided by 6. And this has been adopted by all the measurements we use in the pyramid. What is funny about this number is if we use five of these numbers, we multiply them, it also gives us 2,616, which the square root of that is 1.618. So the relation between the hexagon and the triangle is already the first step. The next one we'll see in the next picture, please. Yeah, we've got to use the Robert's right, I forgot to tell you. The diameter is one unit. It doesn't matter if it's one centimeter, one meter, one kilometer. The proportion is still the same. It's if you divide the perimeter by the diameter, as we know, it gives you pi. Okay, and that gives you, if you divide by six, it gives you 0.52359. Okay, but it is only a ratio. It is not a number. We'll get to the number later on. I need to emphasize something. <laughs> this number, 0 0.523, is the number of the royal cubit. Yes. It's without proportions at this stage. That means if you take any circle with, with one, you get, and you divide by six, you get this number. Now, that suggests, but doesn't prove, no. that there is a relationship between the royal cubit and, and the unit 
of one. There is a royal qubit is in relation to the perimeter. There's no doubt about it there. And if, as I said before, we we'll go quickly about it. If you take five of these directionally multiplied by five, gives you 2,168. If you take the square root of that, it's 1.618, which is the royal number. Okay. Now, we're going to the star. We've gone through the circle. We've gone through the hexagon. We're going to go to the star. The star is a figure which is designed as a perfect pentagon designed into a circle which forms a star. Now funny enough, this is not me, it's very old. Any proportion of this star is always 1.618. Whatever you do, that is the same proportion. So we're tying the proportion of the triangle with the circle, with the hexagon, and now with the star, which is exactly what my client here, the pharaoh, wanted. Okay? Now, if we were to take, mix the whole thing together, in other words, we would take the perimeter of 1760 royal cubits, which is the perimeter of the pyramid, and we would insert in that perfect um, circumference of 1760, we would insert the pentagon, which in other words is a star, if you want. If you take one of the curves of these, you divide it, in other words, you divide the perimeter by five, you get a number of 352. This number of 352 is of vital importance to the design. Because if you shift the decimal point two away, in other words, you divide it by 100, you get 3.52, okay? 3.52, you look carefully there, is in meters, would represent 3.52 times the, the um, sorry, <coughs> pardon, times the royal cubit, you'd get 1,843 meters, in other words, 1.843 meters if you want. This number is very important because it reflects something else, which I don't know if I have to talk to you about it now, but anyway. Uh, 1,843 meters represents one minute of one degree of latitude. Why? Because if you take 1,760, which is the perimeter of the pyramid, and you multiply it by two, you would get 3,520. So there is a big relation between the pentagon, the star, and the perimeter of the pyramid. Now. What is strange is if you take that 1.843 and you divide it into two concavities, it gives you 0 0.9215 for each concavity. Now, if you remember what Mr. Uh, our great Egyptologist Flinders Petri said, he said it's between 36 and 37 inches, which is exactly that measure. Okay? Now we can go to the next one. So, in reality, the concavity. The concavity itself is 1.76 royal cubits. Now, in this drawing, which is a bit, uh, maybe, we insert everything. We insert the right angle triangle, which is, I think, B shows there, right? Oh, I can't see very well. Yeah. Then you insert a hexagon, and then you insert a pentagon, making the star figure if you want and you look so each quarter of this perimeter is 440 royal cubits since the whole perimeter is 1760 now if you look on the left there you'll find that the point of the pentagon is 352 like you saw on the other picture before and the difference between the point of the pentagon and the hexagon is 88 now there's something very strange about this is because if you divide 352 right by 2 it gives you 176 and if you multiply 88 by 2 the opposite thing you multiply it also gives you 176 and 176 is exactly what we saw before which is the concavity measure okay i hope it's clear i'm not sure anyway ah. okay in my view, it is far-fetched to assume the designer, it is not far-fetched to assume the design of the Great Pyramid used the same approach to calculate the concavity. 
If this is correct, then it follows that the designer cleverly integrated several important symbols related to the known ideologies, in other words, the circle, hexagon, the pyramid, and the star, okay? In the pyramid age, and as expounded in the so-called pyramid text, that they associate the pyramid edifice to both the solar disk and the five-pointed star. Then you have the hexagon, which represents two inverted pyramids. You have the pentagon, which is a five-pointed star, and you have the circle, which is the sun disk. Okay? All the above require, by necessity, obviously, the knowledge which they had of phi and pi. In other words, 1.618 and 3.142, if you want. Now we have seen how step one produces an uncanny connection between the royal cubit and the meter in a non-dimensional manner. In other words, we have a relation, we have a ratio, we don't have a size, okay? That is without units. I will now try and demonstrate that another circle can be derived from the geometry of the Great Pyramid to the other circle, this time with royal cubits measurement that convert to one meter. A comparison, I got to two decimal places, to four decimal places. Now the next drawing is, okay, this is uh, the top of the pyramid, we can skip it. Now, what happens is that normally we were beginning to think that uh, the edges of the pyramid, in other words, the four edges of the motor's faces, the four edges convert to the apex of the pyramid, okay? Now the concavity measure with other ratio which you saw in the first triangle, we, we were skipping here because it, there's a lot of mathematics involved. If you take the concavity measure and you take it away from the, the, the 440 units, you'll find that it gives you, each unit gives you 218.24 royal cubits. Now that proportion times the, the concavity will give you a height a height of what you see down there is 277.758 to be exact height in royal cubits. Which means between that platform that you see down there and the apex of the pyramid, you have two, you've got 2.242 royal cubits left. Now if you cross the two uh, edges of the pyramid into triangles and you so you, you've got if you look down there there's a southeast edge that goes to the northwest this one triangle the blue one and the other one goes from the southwest to the northeast is another triangle okay this is this would see if you imagine the apex of the pyramid all right now my doubts were that uh, these measurements that we have I wanted to have them checked by a computer, not by simply designing on my drawing board. So I gave the computer people the base, right? Which is, you see there, there's 277.758, and you find the height on the right here, it says 1.242 royal cubits. And the, the distance between the, the two edge slopes is 4.977 royal cubits with a height of 1.242 royal cubits. Now these form a triangle, an isosceles triangle, and my doubts were, can we prove that in this space, this what we call virtual space, is Robert's idea, I think it's a great name, virtual space, well, I gave it to some computer experts and they designed it and we got a circle inside down to three decimal points, giving us, in royal cubits, because I gave them the measurements in royal cubits, they gave me the diameter of that circle as 1.911 royal cubits. Now, if you look on the left up there, it's a bit difficult in mathematics, but 1.991 royal cubits, okay, is equivalent, if you measured it in the, in the um, cubit me measurement by 0.52359, it will give you exactly six, okay? So now what happens is that if you insert a, a hexagon in there, which was the original figure, right? And you convert the 1.911 into with the royal cubit, it'll give you exactly one meter, exactly. 
down to three decimal points. Okay? And now we have two dimensions. We're not talking about ratios, we're talking about 1.911 royal qubits is equivalent exactly to one meter. This has tremendous implications. And I'm going to try and tell you what they are. It means that the people who designed this, the designer, the architect, I don't know, it wasn't me by the way anyway, and had knowledge of the meter. If not, he would not do this. It would not, and I, this has been computer checked and it's correct, absolutely correct. Now the height, as you see, of 277 down there, the 277.758, is derived from the concavity. And the concavity, as you've seen, has been derived through the pentagon, the star, the hexagon, the main. So everything is tied in. Now, the implications of, that the, the designer knew about the meter, it means he knew he must have known, him or many other people at the time, of the dimensions of the globe, of our Earth. What is strange is that the French uh, expedition held by Napoleon went to Egypt, came back and ordered through the French Institute of Geology to measure exactly. And they found, they measured from the equator up to the North Pole, and they divided that into 10 million parts and they gave them a meter. Now, I'm not sure if they got it from the Egyptians or what, but it so happens that it is exactly the same thing. And which really, the, the implications of this means that whoever designed the pyramid, not built, designed the pyramid, knew about the dimensions of our Earth, which has enormous implications. And I won't go into detail because the pyramid represents much more than this in astronomical points. But anyway, this has been the proof to me that the royal qubit is exactly a relation to the meter. And that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Well done. Not bad for a first talk. No uh, <laughs> okay, me being the philosopher behind all this, because there's a lot of numbers here, and, but basically what it boils down to, and this is, I'll put it as simply as possible. Whoever designed this, and if they followed the same logic as an architect did, using these figures and symbols, uh, the hexagon and so forth, was by obligation using two, two universal constants. We call them numbers that are built in nature, they're built in you. Nature is constructed with constants like pi and phi and many others that we don't have time to do. What it seems to come out of this is that not only they need to use these universal numbers to create this machine, but somehow it had something to do with the Earth itself. Now, we don't know, but there is no doubt here that this it proves, this is not just theory, it proves that they were using a meter unit. And the implication is that if they use the meter unit, they must have measured the planet. They must have. There is no other way you can get the meter. Now, if that's the case, and we're finding other things, he's pointing out to a uh, number, one, one, 1.843, is that it? Well, 1.843 is this magical number that is the way the Earth is designed, whoever, how this Earth is built, because it produces a meteorological unit, he was saying it. Yeah. So all this suggests that whoever designed this was some sort of Newton or ancient of his time. The huge, huge question is how did he get this information from? And I will leave you with pondering on this because we're going to mention a discussion in the book that we're doing. Okay, say thank you. Thank you. I just want to add one thing. Just quickly, and then I'll leave David. I'm taking some of your time, sorry. No, 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 no not, not yet. Anyway, that measure of 1843 is very important. Why? 
because it represents, as I told you, one minute of one degree latitude. In other words, the people knew exactly. Our numbers actually today are exactly that, 1,800, and I, there's a diff slight difference. We have 1,843.93. So we're really very close. They were very close, or we are very close, I don't know. What happens is that you've got to understand that this number has to be implied, which is exactly twice the perimeter of the pyramid, 1,760 royal cubits multiplied by 2 would give you 3,520. 3, now, which represents one, which represent one kilometer. Now, what is strange about this is that they had to build the pyramid with that number. There was no other way. Now, if they wanted to use it one to one scale, they would have to build the pyramid twice as large. If they had to build the pyramid half the scale, it would have not covered the mound that Robert was saying. So they chose a, a, a ratio of half. And that's why they chose 1,760 cub royal cubits, which twice the perimeter would give you 3,520. Now, as I said, if they use the full, if the whole perimeter were to be 3,520, then it would be a huge pyramid. That's why they chose this size. Anyway, David, that's your side now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>